Death has taken our beloved Howie, and we come together this morning in a kinship of sorrow. And as we share our sorrow, we do not share our cell phones or our cameras. And so I ask that you make sure that your cell phones and cameras are in the off or silent position so that we can be present for each other and present for the service. Together we grieve in our darkened world. In our silence, there is lamentation. In our tears, there is loneliness. Lost in our sorrow, may we find the presence of loving friends. Hear us, O oh God, be with us. For Howie's life that united us in life in which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and mind that brought us so much precious joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance. For all these and more, we give thanks for his life, for his talent, for his love. Psalm 23, if you know the words, please join with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Rabbi Alvin Fine wrote, Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength or strength to weakness and often back again, from health to sickness and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, a stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage to life everlasting. Chaim Potok once taught, we live less than the, than the time it takes to blink an eye if we measure our lives against eternity. So it may be asked, what value is there to a human life? There is so much pain in the world. What does it mean to have to suffer so much if our lives are nothing more than the blink of an eye? I learned a long time ago, Chaim Potok wrote, that the blink of an eye in itself is nothing, but the eye that blinks. That is something. A span of life is nothing, but the person who lives the span is something. A person can fill that tiny span with meaning, so its quality is immeasurable, though its quantity may be insignificant. An individual's life must be filled with meaning. Meaning is not automatically given to life. It is hard to fill one's life with meaning. A life with meaning is worthy of rest. Howie's life was cut short, but it was deeply filled with meaning, meaning that enriched so many lives. What a gift he was to remember him with love and affection at this during this service. It is an honor for me to call forward a number of speakers who represent the fullness of Howie's life. I'll introduce them all now and they'll come up in that order with no further introduction. To speak this morning will be Jill Gresham, uh, Larry's stepdaughter, Jonah Chiswick, grandson of Larry, 
Michael Chizik, Tim Dininger, Bob Klaus, and Andrew Risner, each have been touched so deeply and loved so deeply by Howie and who loved him in return. It's an honor to call them forward. First, Jill, Jonah, and Michael. Howie Chizik was so many things to so many different people. To me, he will always be Uncle Howie. I remember he would always come over our house and say, who wants to have fun today? That meant anything from going to the corner to get something to eat, lengthy discussions over song lyrics, to a week or so in Disney World. No matter what, you knew when he said fun, he meant it. But some of the greatest times would be just getting to spend the night at his house. We would watch TV or maybe a movie. He would even let me help him make dinner. Whatever we did, we would do it together. He never yelled at us or tried to be our parents. He was the fun uncle. And even more importantly, he was our friend. He mentored us, he educated us with his actions and his encouragement, but never trying to lecture us. We learned things without knowing we were learning things. I remember spending the night at his house one time and he had gotten me a really detailed model car to build. We worked on it together for hours. At one point, I was having trouble putting it together. I got really frustrated, picked up the car, slammed it down, stormed off and pouted in front of the TV in the other room until I fell asleep. I still feel bad about that. When I woke up in the morning, the car was sitting on the table, fully completed. To this day, I have no idea how long that took him to do. He took me to more Cavs games than I can count, tons of forced soccer games, and even some of the hockey games, but I really can't even remember what the name of that team was. I'll never forget the miracle at Richfield, Colonial Williamsburg, and the days we had at the park. He would let me bring friends with me. We would run the Coliseum like we owned the place. It was like our giant playground. We would sneak around on the lows levels and hang out with the organ player and the stats guy. I, I usually miss most of the game. I would always be down at the announcer's booth at halftime, though, to check in with Uncle Howie. And he would always ask me how the game was going, even though he knew I was only probably paying half attention to it. No matter where in the stadium you were, though, you could always hear his voice. So I felt like he was always right there with me. I'll miss that voice. I know we all will. After each one of my, our five children were born, was born, the hardest thing for me is that my grandfather, Howie's father, who loved children so much, would never have a chance to lay eyes on them. When we would go to his house for family get-togethers, the look in Uncle Howie's eyes when he interacted with my children was the same look I expected to see in my grandfather's eyes. Now I'll never get to see that again. Uncle Howie just wanted to see a smile on our face. He always put the needs of others before his own. I pray every day that I am able to instill this in my children, even half as much as he did for us. Fortunately for me, my wife is the same way. Maybe that's why she and Uncle Howie hit it off from the beginning, because they could see that in each other. I know that because of his influence, 
I was able to find such an incredible person and always look for the best in others. Truth is, Uncle Howard never liked to be fussed over. He would rather do the fussing. His joy came from bringing joy to others. I would ask you all to help me honor his memory by going out and doing something nice for someone else without expecting anything in return. Do it just to see the smile on their face. Life is a journey, and it's not about what you have, where you live, or what you, what you drive that counts. It's about how you conduct yourself, what you do for others, and lending a helping hand whenever possible. This is how Uncle Howie lives. Is it? Uncle Howie came into my life when I was an adult. However, he always made me feel as if we'd been family my whole life. Over the years, our relationship became one of family, friendship, and respect. My sister, brother, and I always knew that we could ask for advice or share a joke or just hang out with Uncle Howie. While what I told him or discussed with him was private, that didn't mean he wouldn't use my real-life escapades for his radio show. I was always glad to be of service. <laughs> Uncle Howie's tolerance of everyone and everything only made us love him more. He didn't judge, but he did have opinions and loved to share them. When it came to Uncle Howie's heart, his love had no boundaries, as shown to all of us by Jackson, his three-and-a-half-year-old neighbor, who he shared Klondike bars and lemonade with on a regular basis. When it came to those in need, Uncle Howie's generosity was endless. One particular holiday stands out for me. The year was 2002 and the holiday was Thanksgiving. It was just the two of us, and we decided to make a traditional meal together. Keep in mind, there was only two of us. A five pound bag of potatoes, eight boxes of stuffing, and a 20 pound turkey for two. We ate and laughed until we couldn't move, and then he took to the story to the airwaves. I could go on forever remembering and cherishing memories of my Uncle Howie. To my stepfather, Larry, thank you for sharing Uncle Howie with our family. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all his fans, his kids that he cherished. Chris, Trisha, Matt, Jackie, Madison, Jonah, my mom, and Larry for their support and love during this sad time for all of us. I would like to recognize Radio WNIR for their care, concern, and respect for our family, and most of all, for their love of Uncle Howie. Over the last five days, I've been comforted by the comments and calls to the radio station of love, support, and respect for Uncle Howie. I know he meant so much to so many. It is apparent that Uncle Howie touched tens of thousands of people, made them think, made them care, and made me proud. I would like to close with one more recent story about Uncle Howie. On June 9th of this year, Uncle Howie turned 65. He didn't really want a party, but thank God he reconsidered. Matt and Jackie hosted all of us for a barbecue bash at their home. We got him his favorite cake and a new digital, new digital camera for his trip to Florida. To say he was happy is putting it mildly. It gives us great comfort to know that Uncle Howie knew he was loved by all of us, and he will live in our hearts forever. Tim, to come forward. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, Howie Chizik. I think we could talk for hours. I'm sure we will. I'd just like to relate one quick story. And I think it kind of sums up the, the fellow that how he was. Back in 1991, a mutual friend of ours, John Zapolo, I believe he's here, I was looking for a offensive line coach to help out at St. Anne's, now the Communion of Saints. And, uh, I had met Howie only one time in passing. I didn't really know him. And John suggested, you know, you should go talk to Howie. It's been a few years. He had been three, four, five years since he had coached over in the old Northeast League. I said, okay. So I showed up at his remote broadcast at Claiborne Ford on a Saturday afternoon. And he was walking to his car, 
and he, I was approaching him, and he kind of looked at me like, not really recognizing me. I only met him once. And he stopped, and I said, I'm Coach D, how you doing? We met. Oh, okay. I said, I come to get you to coach with me. And he kind of hemmed and he hawed, and he says, you know, I'm kind of retired, and, you know, I said, I, and I was not taking no for an answer. So he, finally, after about a half hour, he kind of looked at me and went, I said, I'll make you a deal. I've got this charitable thing I'm doing next week. I'm going to Florida, but I'll be back. I didn't even know about the new adventures at that time. He says, I'll come out a day or two a week, and I'll help out with, uh, you know, some of the new kids who need to get into a stance and things like that. Howard didn't miss a practice for 12 years after that. And I think that kind of sums up Howard's uh, motivation, dedication, and everything he stood for. And, you know, a year into the program, he was our assistant head coach and a, a huge part of everything that we stood for and have done over many, many years. Um, I, this could go on forever, but I'll tell you what. Take a look at this picture up here and that smirk on his face. And that really sums it all up. He's got that smile that says, I know something you don't. Well, okay, Howard, what is it? Just smile for him and smile for all of us. You know, a testament to him is all the people that are here. But think about what we all have in common with Howie. And that's, that's what's golden about this moment. Thank you. Bob Klaus owner of WNIR. I'm speaking today the entire Klaus family. Every morning for the last 38 years, one of the first group of people I would see was Howie. Sitting at his desk with a handful of news clippings, a pen, and a legal pad. I would greet him with the same greeting. Hi, Hal. How are you? to which I would get the full report on the vital statistics. And a synopsis of the juicy subjects he planned to introduce to the audience that day. Howie with a juicy subject was like a kid with a new bike. His excitement was contagious. And I knew that the audience was going to get another day of great radio. My father hired Howie in 1974. On June 3rd, 1974, Howie opened his mic for the first time in what would become the longest running radio talk show in America. In March of 1975, I joined my father's business at age 23. Little did I know that this man would be such an integral part of my life for the next 37 years. I learned this business at both of their knees. My father, master radio broadcaster off mic, and Howie, many years his junior, but even at that young age, a master radio broadcaster on mic. Together, they invented non-guest talk radio. Nor at that time did I know how much of my life would be spent listening to his show. Back in 1975, when my friends were listening to rock and roll, I was listening to the magic that was happening from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at 100 FM on the radio dial. I loved listening to his show and did so for thousands of hours. And like so many of his hundreds of thousands, even millions of fans, not being able to continue listening leaves an immense void. Because in addition to being Howie's friend and employer, I too was a huge fan.
One week ago today, I listened for a few solid hours as I was driving to and from Cleveland. As usual, he was right on point. But the audience was picking on him pretty bad. When I arrived back at the station, his show had concluded. He was at the computer checking his email. I told him, Howie, I had the great pleasure to be able to listen to the show today. And it was another great one. But I can't figure out why the audience was picking on you so much. To which he replied sarcastically, that's what they do when you're number one. <laughs> we laughed, and I responded, I guess so, but today I don't think you deserved it. We had another laugh and went about our business. That was my last conversation with Howard, and I am so thankful to have had that moment with him because he knew that I was really telling him that I loved him and appreciate him. So this loss is profoundly personal, but it is also profoundly professional. Howie was the bedrock of the talk of Akron, WNIR. He was the sun that shines so bright its light obscured the view of the other stars in the sky. Not that he wanted to obscure them, he just couldn't help it. Now that the sun has set, I wish to do what I believe Howie, in all his humility, would have done. Deflect as much of the doting attention and accolades from himself to others with the okay. setting of the sun the light of these stars will emerge with a greater brilliance. Howie would want us to go on, and so we shall, in his memory, keeping the flame of local, open-line, non-guest okay. talk radio lit for the community. Goodbye, goodbye, my friend, and God bless. For Andrew Risner to come forward. Howie, Howie, Howie. Um, I've been fortunate uh, to have met Howie about 20 years. been a good friend of mine. And uh, I actually met him through uh, St. Anne's football, which uh, Coach talked a little bit about previously, about how he brought him over. And a couple years after I'd met him, he talked about this charitable organization, charitable organization that he had called uh, New Adventures. And uh, he told me a little bit about it. I was very interested in it. And I uh, heard some of the other friends of mine that were a little bit older had got an opportunity to go on this trip. So he eventually invited me to go on this trip. I was very excited. And you know, people have heard about all the charitable work that Howie has done. New Adventures is a charitable organization he created um, about 38 years ago. And the motto of the organization is Direction Today for Tomorrow's Leaders. A lot of people have heard about this trip you know, think it's about kids going to Florida, having fun. Sure, that's part of it, but there's more to it. Howie was a mentor to all the kids who went on this trip, a friend, helped, you know, it was a group that Howie picked of kids from all different backgrounds, and Howie had that magical power to mesh all the kids together, and the camaraderie that these kids had, just, I'll never forget that. I've been fortunate enough to go on this trip for now 19 years, and I've just seen Howie with that magic. And for somebody to be able to do something like that is pretty incredible. Howie did this trip out of love for kids, and he did it all out of his pocket as well. And we heard a couple of people talk earlier, he never asked for anything in return. I'm very humbled to have been part of that, and very gracious that Howie allowed me to go not only as a, a kid, but also to help mentor um, kids as well as I became a, a young adult. So for that, I thank him, and certainly his memory and generosity will never be forgotten. We take a uh, moment now for silent remembrance for each of us to have our own thoughts, our own memories, our own prayers for how
words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Adonai, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. The poet wrote, when I die, give what's left of me away to children and old people who wait to die. And if you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give to me. I want to leave you something, something better than words or sound. Look for me and the people I've known or loved. And if you cannot give me away, at least let me live in your eyes and not in your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands, by letting bodies touch bodies, and by letting go of children who need to be free. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, please give me away. This morning, may we take these words to heart, knowing that when we love others as how he did, when we teach and mentor and give and laugh as how he did, then we will have fulfilled his legacy by making this world a better place. His memory, his legacy, his love, that is our deepest blessing. At this time, our memorial service here is ended.